next on Unsolved Mysteries. A popular teenager breaks up a fight, and then he's found fatally injured on a lonely road. Was it a random hit and run, or was it cold-blooded murder? A mother and her son both died mysteriously, more than 20 years apart. Could there be a connection? When a woman vanishes, her husband tells two completely different stories about his wife's disappearance. What really happened to Pam Page? A man and his two sons steal millions of dollars through an elaborate Medicaid fraud. When he's finally caught, he disappears. Five compelling cases. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Join us, won't you? Spokane, Washington, 1.05 a.m. Two friends on their way home are startled when their headlights reveal a body stretched out in the road. 13-year-old Russell Evans has apparently been struck by a car. He is barely alive. Call 911. <coughs> Ryan, help me! Russell is admitted to Sacred Heart Hospital at 1.30 a.m. As his parents stand by, doctors struggle through the night to save his life. When I got there, I just wanted to see him, and so I went right to the trauma room, and he was unconscious. Mom's here. I just knew he wasn't going to make it. The emergency team works frantically, but by morning, Russell Evans is dead. I'm really grateful that I had those eight hours because even though he didn't talk to me, I knew he was, knew I was there. And um, that was really important to me. The mangled body of a teenage boy lies in the street, perhaps the victim of a careless driver or perhaps the target of a deliberate murderous attack. In the case of Russell Evans, his parents and local police have drawn opposite conclusions from the same set of evidence. Russell was an active and popular eighth grader at Libby Middle School in Spokane. By the age of 13, he was already six feet, three inches tall. We did everything together. He was at my house every day, and he was very well liked. and a good sense of humor. And he got along with pretty much everybody. He had no problems. In the hours before Russell died, he was with Aaron and other friends hanging out at a local park. It was a typical summer evening until they were approached by two other teenagers. <laughs> hey, man, come here real quick. And what's your name? Aaron. Aren't supposed to be going there? Yeah. Let me tell you something, man. Hey, hey, you guys better just take off before there's some real trouble. Hey, you don't even know what trouble is. Oh, really? Yeah. He said, you better watch out because you get some of my homeboys on you. But I didn't really think much of it, you know. So I just turned around and we left, and he got in his car with his friend and took off. After leaving the park, Russell spent the rest of the evening at a friend's house. And then he called his father to say that he was heading home. It was then about 12.30 a.m. Based on evidence found at the scene, police constructed a hit-and-run scenario. On the impact with the vehicle, he was separated from his shoes, the shoelaces, and other debris. Uh, he finally came to rest about 75 feet from where we think he was struck. 
From the bruises, uh, President Russell, I think the most prominent possibility here is that we're dealing with a motor vehicle accident. The Russell was struck in the back by a bumper and an ornament. We looked at him after he died, and I thought he'd been in a fight. Later on, when the police started talking about hit and run, uh, his mom, mom and I just couldn't buy that. I mean, the injuries weren't there. John and Sue Evans obtained copies of the official police report complete with photographs. They noted that Russell's shoes didn't have their laces on. Somehow, they had been torn out. To Russell's parents, it seemed like an important clue. The Evans returned to the scene of the accident with Sandy Ferris, the woman who had found Russell. You see that? We got there is blood on the shoelace. Now tell me, how do you get blood on the shoelace if you're struck and driven out of your shoes and thrown 50 feet down the hill. He was about right up there. John and Sue became convinced that their son had been struck by something other than a hit and run driver. And they hired their own pathologist to investigate. While he concluded that Russell had been hit by a car, he also found evidence of a struggle. He's right about up in here. This pathologist came back with the findings that Russell had been in a physical altercation prior to his death. If a body flies through the air, when that body hits the pavement, there would be some massive scraping. Russell did not have this. Boy, this isn't making a lot of sense, I'll tell you. Based on their research, Russell's parents reconstructed their son's final moments. I think it was a fight going back up the hill. According to his hands, he got his licks in. He had finger bruises on his face and the side of the nose, finger bruising on his upper fore upper arms as uh, though he were being held. The people that were allegedly involved in the argument with this friend of Russ's uh, were polygraphed. Uh, because other people were making allegations about them. They passed the polygraph by flying cars. When I first got there, first thing I asked him was what happened, and he started calling for Brian. Help me out! Brian, help me out! He said it more like a person was in listening distance, that his friend should have been there. Uh, like, he thought his friend was close by. After the police had gotten there and they started to put Russell in the ambulance, we saw a boy in white shorts up in the bushes, and he was running up the hill. And I tried to tell the policeman this a couple of times, and he kept telling me to get on the sidewalk. I thought maybe that probably could have been the boy that he was calling for, Brian. One of Russell's friends was named Brian. And I asked Brian what he was wearing that night. And he said, well, I was wearing white, white shirts and white t-shirt, but I was nowhere around. Later down the line, when the police questioned him, he denied owning uh, that kind of outfit. We asked for him and talked with everyone that we could possibly think of. And our assumption is it was just somebody uh, that was curious, that heard the commotion, that heard the sirens, that went out to take a look. When Sue Evans arrived at the hospital, someone named Brian had just called the emergency ward to ask about Russell. I don't want any information given out about him. Now, someone by the name of Brian's already called concerning his condition. And that's odd. Who would have known about this sure. unless somebody named Brian was at that scene that he was calling for? There may be one or two that know more than they're telling. And the reason they're probably not telling is that they are afraid for their lives. Evidence from the scene totally convinced Russell's parents that he had been attacked and murdered. The police still believe that Russell was the victim of a hit and run driver. However, officially the case still remains unsolved. If you have any information about the death of Russell Evans, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.
When we come back, two mysterious and violent deaths in the same family, 20 years apart. The small town of Hooksett, New Hampshire. Like most of New England, it springs to life when the winter snows have melted away. Long days and warmer temperatures promise better days to come. But one year, the retreating snow revealed the body of a missing teenager, the second local girl to be found tortured and murdered. One of the victims was a 15-year-old high school student named Pamela Mason. It was rumored that her killer lived in the area, and neighbors began looking at each other with suspicion. 47-year-old Rena Paquette told her friends and family that she knew who had killed the two teenage girls. At the time, nobody took her seriously. But 10 days after the second body was found, Rena's son, 13-year-old Danny Paquette, Mom? came down for breakfast and found that his mother was gone. I'm to Charlie, this is Danny speaking. Yeah, I can't find my mom. Well, she said she was gonna take me to the dentist today. When Danny got up that morning, he couldn't find my mother. Dan couldn't understand where she was because her purse and her winter coat were there and it was extremely bitterly cold, and it was highly unlikely that she went anywhere without her coat. He's not in there, Uncle Charlie. Let's try the Danny and his uncle searched the property for over an hour, but Rena was nowhere to be found. Rena! Oh, Rena! Oh, oh, Smoke. Smoke was coming from the barn. Mom? Rena Paquette was dead. No, Mom! After authorities recovered her Mom. charred body, they concluded that she had deliberately set herself on fire. Rena's death was ruled a suicide. However, her family remains convinced that someone had killed her. I don't really believe my mother committed suicide because of the uh, tremendous amount of fear and panic in the community because of the two earlier brutal murders. I think it was just kind of like kept on a very low profile, not to create more public hysteria. I feel at the time of my mother's death, the person that was found to be the person responsible for killing the young Pamela Mason girl was the same person that was responsible for my mother's death. Within weeks of Rena's death, a local man was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Pamela Mason. Nearly 20 years would pass before Danny Paquette discovered a possible link between the murder of his mother and the killing of the two girls. It was Danny Paquette who had discovered his mother's charred body. Perhaps that's why of Rena's five children, Danny was the most impacted by her death. I think everybody's mom is a little security blanket. And from there, you lose that. Uh, emotionally, it leads to a lot of problems. Danny grew from a troubled teenager into a troubled adult. Oh, I'm going to take you back to February the 3rd. Danny was ordered to undergo a psychiatric examination at a mental hospital. His treatment there led to some unexpected revelations about the past. Under hypnosis, Danny recalled details of the morning that his mother was killed. I woke up because I heard... Uh, I can't believe I'm coming to the hospital. I heard voices. Um, because a man's voice. He was delivered me. Dad, he was yelling at my mom. And I remember I, I went back to my room. I was, I was scared. <laughs> Danny became convinced that he had actually seen the person who had killed his mother. He was certain it was the same delivery man who had murdered Pamela Mason. 
but there was never any evidence to support his belief. Danny returned home after five months and tried to pick up the pieces of his life. He and his brother Victor spent many afternoons together motorcycling through the countryside. If it was a real turning point for him, we spent time together and we started to uh, enjoy life. One Saturday morning, Danny was repairing a bulldozer in his yard while two of his friends worked on a car in the garage. At 11 a.m., Danny's friends heard a loud pop. I ran up towards where Danny was working. It appeared to me that he'd been electrocuted. We noticed the air escaping from a hole in the middle of his chest. And I thought that it was a welding probe that he fell on when he hit the ground. I, at the time, I didn't know it was a, a bullet wound. Danny Paquette had been shot through the heart with a single bullet. He died instantly. A search of the area revealed about 50 to 80 yards away uh, footprints heading toward the woods, whether it was coincidental or in fact. Someone's footprint that was fleeing the scene uh, is, is speculative at this time. Local phone service had stopped at the same time that Danny was killed, and police later pulled a slug from the telephone line. It was the bullet that killed Danny Paquette. The day Danny was shot was the beginning of hunting season, and police thought that he might have been accidentally hit by a straight bullet. We were able to ascertain that uh, there were hunters in a gravel pit approximately a mile away that were sighting their weapons in at the time. If Danny was shot accidentally, the fatal bullet may have come from this gravel pit. For this to happen, the bullet had to travel nearly a mile, climb 1,000 feet, pass through Danny, and then penetrate the telephone cable. Ballistics expert R.J. Breglio was brought in from New York City to determine if such a shot was even possible. Breglio's conclusion, no way. I would rule out the possibility that there was an accident, that the gun was fired from a mile or more away. Rather, it was a shot fired in the vicinity, deliberately. Someone had deliberately targeted Danny and killed him with a single shot. But who? Update. 20 years after Danny Paquette was killed, police arrested 38-year-old Eric Windhurst for the murder. Windhurst was a high school friend of Danny's stepdaughter, Melanie Cooper. She claimed that Danny had sexually abused her. She later admitted that she was with Windhurst when he shot Danny. Windhurst pleaded guilty and received a sentence of 15 to 36 years in prison. He served his time and has been released. For her role in the crime, Melanie Cooper received a sentence of three to five years. She has since been released. The death of Rena Paquette is still classified as a suicide. Next, when a woman in Arizona disappears, police suspect that her husband knows much more than he's saying. Peoria, Arizona is a comfortable suburb just outside of Phoenix. Pam and Rob Page were among those who lived in Peoria, and by all accounts, their marriage was solid. One day, however, Pam Page disappeared without a trace. Rob would later explain that he came home to an empty house and a letter from Pam. Rob, by the time you read this, I'll be a long way from here. I have thought this thing out, and have been planning this for several months. The letter said that Pam had left town with a woman named Sarah. Rob claimed that he was embarrassed because he thought that his wife had left him for another woman. He did not notify Pam's family in Arkansas that she was gone. 
Four days later, however, Pam's oldest sister, Trina, Hi, Rob. happened Trina. to call. I was calling to see how Pam was doing. She's gone. What do you mean she's gone? Well, I came home on Saturday and, and she left me a letter. It seemed out of character to me uh, for her not to let anyone know that where she was where she was at. But I didn't think about that at first. I just was, had one thing on mine was getting my word to somebody that, that she was missing. By the time you read this, I will be a long way from here. Pam's father asked to see the letter and Rob faxed him a copy. When I received that faxed letter, I knew that something was bad wrong. One thing, I looked at the signature. I had birthday cards and uh, letters from Pam, and the, the signature wasn't her signature. Rob told Pam's family that a missing persons report had already been filed. But when one of Pam's sisters called the local police, she discovered that they had never even heard of the case. Detectives began their investigation by questioning Rob. He told them, that on the day of Pam's disappearance, he had gone to several auto park stores. At one, his truck wouldn't start. Rob said he called home and got no answer, so he phoned for a taxi. Rob told police that he never went into the house, only the garage. He got a part for his truck and rode his bike back to the store. When the truck finally started, he drove home, and that's when he found the letter. The letter said that Pam had taken all of their money, $60,000 in cash, out of the safe at the video store. Rob said he went to the store and confirmed that the cash was gone. The letter also said that Pam had left the couple's Corvette at a local donut shop. Rob claimed that he found it the next day. Soon, police began to question the details of Rob's story. None of the employees at the last auto parts store remembered Rob asking about an ignition switch. Rob had said that his truck, which was very distinctive, was parked at the store for nearly four hours that afternoon. None of the employees ever recall seeing that truck being out front of the store or anyone ever working on it. And one particular employee stated if that truck had been out in front of his business, he would have known it. Finally, three weeks after Pam disappeared, the Arizona State Crime Lab confirmed that the signature on the letter was almost certainly not Pam's. Mr. Page uh, refused to believe me and was adamant that his wife had, in fact, signed the letter. After continuing to question Mr. Page about the signature on the letter, he admitted to me that he, in fact, did sign that letter. It was a stunning turnaround, enough to make Rob Page a suspect. Suddenly, he began to tell a completely different story. Now Rob insisted that he had actually found the letter in the family computer a few days before Pam disappeared. Mr. Page stated that while he was on the family's home computer, he discovered a letter that um, he claims his wife had authored in which, in essence, that she was gonna be leaving him. I was working on the computer just now, and I found something very interesting. How'd you find it? Mr. Page stated um, he confronted his wife about that letter. Oh, I'm sorry you found this. I wrote this a long time ago. Oh, then you weren't planning to leave me, huh? No, I wasn't. I wrote this when I was upset. Well, then you're not going to take our money and run off. Rob, huh? why do you have to blow everything out of proportion? According to Rob's new story, a few days after the confrontation, he came home to find the house in a mess. Rob told police that most of Pam's clothes were gone, along with the family pictures and one of their dogs. Pam's credit cards and house keys were on the kitchen table, but Rob could not find her driver's license. Rob claims that after making these discoveries, he decided to act. He went downstairs and added four sentences to the letter in the computer, printed it out, and signed Pam's name. He then drove her Corvette to the donut shop, went to the payphone across the street, and called a taxi. Mr. Page stated that he fabricated some of the things he did because no one would ever believe him that his wife had, in fact, left him had he not done this. 
Due to Mr. Page's uh, inconsistent statements um, throughout this investigation, as well as the suspicious circumstances surrounding the disappearance of his wife, he was offered a polygraph examination on several occasions, and he declined to take a polygraph on each occasion that it was offered. Despite the suspicions about Rod Page, police found no evidence that he had done anything wrong except change his story. No charges were filed, and the investigation ground to a halt. This is a picture of your sister, Pam. As a last resort, Pam's sister, Jimmy Rice, consulted Carol Pate, a psychic in Little Rock, Arkansas. Pate had worked with the Little Rock police for 10 years. Working only from a photo of Pam, the psychic recounted a disturbing scenario. Thank you. I saw her with a man in what appeared to be her house, and she was arguing with him. He knocks her to the floor. He's trying to strangle her. He grabs a pillow, and all of a sudden, she's, she's quiet. Then a female comes. She assists him in placing her in the trunk. Now I'm seeing them pull out of the garage, and they're driving. Then I'm seeing a factory, and it's gray in color, and there's a railroad track parallel. Then he pulls over on the side of the road and removes the body and begins to dig. The name Coolidge comes into my mind. And two, four, one. Jana Thorson, an Arizona newspaper reporter covering Pam's disappearance, followed up the clues. Thorson did find a gray factory building near some railroad tracks in Peoria. Nearby, she found a sign with the numbers 241. A route that ran from Bob and Pam's house to the home of a friend passed both these sites and ended at a street named Coolidge. There is no way to evaluate Carol Pate's information until it is known whether Pam Page met with foul play or chose to disappear. As for Rob Page, he still insists that his wife is alive. Rob Page declined our request for an interview and has since divorced his missing wife. Police say that he is no longer a suspect in this case, and they still have no idea what happened to Pam Page. Pam has red hair and brown eyes and is five feet, eight inches tall. If you have any information about the disappearance of Pam Page, please log on to our website at unsolved. Com. Coming up, how did Sheldon Weinberg manage to steal $16 million from New York's Medicaid program? We recently profiled the disturbing story of a New York businessman named Sheldon Weinberg. Along with his two sons, Weinberg stole an estimated $16 million of taxpayers' money, funds allocated to medical care for the poor. Sheldon Weinberg and his sons operated the Bed-Stuy Health Clerk Clinic in one of Brooklyn, New York's poorest neighborhoods. They employed over 25 physicians and catered primarily to Medicaid recipients. That's very good. They're coming through. But their real specialty was fraud. They were submitting up to $30,000 a week in false billings to the government. They began small, manually writing up uh, phony records and phony bills. But once they started getting away with it, they realized the scam was working. The Weinbergs started using a computer to create bills and medical records for non-existent charges. Their profits soared from thousands to millions of dollars. Oh, Jay, can we bring these numbers up? Why not? They used Medicaid like it was a private bank account for them. And from that bank account, the Weinbergs led the high life on the backs of poor people. I think their appetite for 
conspicuous living for fancy clothes, and especially shoes, uh, was only outdone by Imelda Marcos. For seven years, the money rolled in. But the Weinberg's elaborate scheme started to unravel when authorities investigated their billing practices. Auditors spent weeks carefully searching through the clinic's records and tracing the phony billings. If you look at the medical charts, you'll see that a four-year-old boy was uh, shown as having smoked four packs of cigarettes a day and having drank a quarter of booze a day. You found men with gynecological problems, and uh, that's the type of things that jumped out off the paper at you. Sheldon Weinberg and his two sons, Ronald and Jay, were convicted of grand larceny, conspiracy, and 63 other counts relating to their fraud scheme. Ronald Weinberg was sentenced to five to 15 years in prison. Jay Weinberg received an eight to 25 year sentence with additional time for tax evasion. They served their time and have been released. Sheldon Weinberg faced a seven to 21 year prison term, but just before sentencing, he and his wife disappeared. Update. Within three hours of our broadcast, Sheldon Weinberg was arrested by FBI agents in Scottsdale, Arizona, where he and his wife were living under assumed names. Right after the show aired, we got specific information from callers who had seen them all over the Scottsdale area. And one of the callers told us that the Weinbergs were using the alias DeVita. And this corresponded with information we previously had back here in New York, that they were traveling under that name. So when the caller told us that uh, he had seen people that looked like the Weinbergs using the name DeVita in Scottsdale, we knew we had our man. Weinberg was brought back to New York and three days later appeared before New York State Supreme Court Justice Ruth Moskowitz who reimposed the seven to 21 year sentence. I do not regard this as a white collar crime. This is a crime of violence to all of the people of New York City. This is a crime of violence to the Medicaid recipients. Medicaid state funds should not go so that people could live in Trump Towers, so that people could live in luxury on Florida estates. Authorities have recovered less than six million of the estimated $16 million that Weinberg and his son stole from taxpayers. After serving 16 years in a New York prison, Sheldon Weinberg was released. His son Ronald has also been released and his son Jay served its time and has been released. You find yourself in a strange and alien place. You scan your surroundings for clues. Even your own possessions are unrecognizable. Finally, the terrifying realization. You don't know where you are. You don't even know who you are. You are suffering from amnesia. That's exactly what happened to a woman who one day woke up in a park in New Orleans. That's horrible. <laughs> And it's, it's so sudden, like, you're not prepared for it. You don't expect things like that to happen to you. I didn't know what to do. I knew I had to go get help somewhere. The woman thought her name might be Gigi. She carried a strange assortment of things. Four pairs of scissors, a gold-plated table setting, UPS forms used only by company employees, and deposit envelopes from banks across the Northeastern United States. She was also carrying 26 tubes of lipstick, 24 lip liner pencils, and lots of other cosmetics. Police reviewed hundreds of missing persons files. Doctors probed and tested. Even sodium amethyst, a so-called truth serum, was given to Gigi. Nothing worked. Her past remained a secret that no one could unlock. She has made a conscious effort to assist me on every phase of trying to find out who she is through the law enforcement agencies, through the media. If she was in fact trying to conceal her identity, she would not have 
sign the releases that allow us to do this. Doyle McGee was puzzled by the total absence of anything personal in Gigi's wallet or handbag. He feared that this was no accident. Somebody has gone to great pains to make sure that we don't know who she is. The wallets are fairly new. They had absolutely nothing personal in them. No personal photos, no credit cards, no checks. What could have triggered Gigi's amnesia? Experts believe that she experienced something so horrible that in her own defense, her memory simply shut down. Update. During the broadcast of this story, several viewers called our phone center saying that they did recognize Gigi. She was identified as Belinda Lynn from Wilmington, Delaware. However, none of the callers could tell us how she got to New Orleans or why she lost her memory. Next, the reunion of a young woman and her mother launches a new search for two long lost sisters. In San Francisco, California, Jackie Dragon grew up in a typical middle-class home. She knew she had been adopted, but had no information about her birth parents. But for some reason, Jackie had an extraordinary interest in films and television shows about women in prisons. There was some strange sense of security that I felt in watching the stories and, you know, the women interacting in, these, in their lives and their relationships in prison. At the age of 12 years old, Jackie made a surprising discovery. I was sneaking around in my father's closet and looking through a box of papers. And what I found were legal papers. And as I read through them, I realized they were my adoption papers. Jacqueline Stark. It was a big thing. It was a turning point. It was something that I knew from that point on that someday I would find those people in that paper. I searched, you know, off and on for a number of years. When I got the information that I wasn't born in some hospital somewhere, but that I was born in prison. Say bye bye, mommy. Jackie learned that she was born at a women's prison in Chicago. Her mother, Marge Ryder, was serving a one year sentence for her part in an armed robbery. After more than nine years of searching, Jackie finally located her birth mother. Hi, may I speak with Marge Ryder, please? Speaking. And what I realized was that in a way, I was setting myself up to feel rejected all over again. Does the date February 16th, 1964 mean anything to you? What did you say your name was again? Well, my name is Jackie. I can't believe you're calling me. Not for a second did she hesitate. She was happy that I called, and I felt so relieved and so lucky. Well, do you have time to talk right now? I've got all the time in the world to talk now, yes. March talked about the agonizing decision to give Jackie up for adoption. I convinced myself that the best thing to do for Jackie was to give her a home that I assumed had two upstanding parents, that there was security in that home, that she could be guaranteed an education, all the things that I knew at that time in my life, there was no way I could possibly give her any of that. After she had left, they came and told me that Jackie had gone to her new home in some other state, and it hurt. Same as it's hurt now. That's one memory I didn't lose. A few weeks after saying goodbye to Jackie, Marge completed her sentence and was released. She never again got in trouble with the law. She married and lived a conventional life. But when she talked to Jackie years later, Marge did have some dramatic news. One of the first things she said was, I never thought any of you girls would be calling me. 
And then she let me know that there were two other sisters. It was, it was very exciting. I couldn't believe it. It was like, there's more? You're kidding. There's something more that I didn't know? Marge's first daughter, Laura May, was just 18 months old when Marge went to prison. She was left in the care of Marge's grandmother. The courts just stepped in because she was too old a woman to raise a infant child. And I think, I think they lost her as well as I did. Laura May was ultimately taken by the Cook County Welfare Department and became a ward of the state. Marge never saw Laura May again. After her prison term, Marge gave birth to a third daughter, Dawn Marie. She too was given up for adoption. I had often gone over in my mind, what if they come looking for me? I felt I was giving each child the very best that I could give them. Marge Ryder flew to California and met her daughter, Jackie, for the first time. It's nice to be here. That, really amazing. This is Laura May, and this is you, of course. Wow, you can definitely tell it's family. She really looks the same. Look at all those knees. I guess. <laughs> Thanks to our viewers, Jackie Dragon and Marge Ryder's dreams of reuniting their family finally came true. After we first broadcast the story, they were contacted by Laura May, now called Susan, and by Dawn Marie, whose adoptive name is Carla. Three months later, they all got together at Jackie's home in Glendale, California. Hi, Susan. Oh, it's good to meet you. I think when I first started feeling really comfortable is when we went out and took some Polaroids. It's a very once-in-a-lifetime kind of a thing to find a sister that you've never met. Everybody smile. Each one is totally individual. They're all strong, I've found out. And they've done good with their lives. I'm proud of them.